welcome to another episode of Lexitecture, a podcast about words by word nerds and for you. My name is Ryan, and in each episode, my friend Amy and I will be talking about our two favorite words of the week, looking at their origins and history, and generally chatting about how they got to where they are today. If that sounds like your cup of tea, come along for the ride and let's explore the weird and wonderful world of the English language. Today's episode, Rank Yahoo. I'm pretty excited about this one, actually. Nice. So the word that I have chosen is rank. R-A-N-K, rank. R-A-N-K. And so I was looking at this, and the, the reason that I was thinking about it was the thing that occurred to me was the difference between having a rank, like what rank a person is in the military or what have mm-hmm. you, and the phrase rank amateur or mm. rank injustice or whatever, what have you. Okay. And I was like, how do those relate? So that's, that's why I looked this up. Okay. And it turns out that rank the noun, and rank the adjective are utterly unrelated. Mm. Which I always find really interesting when there's two words that you're like, of course they're related somehow. No. Not at all. So rank the noun is from, it's it's basically borrowed, it's a French borrowed word. So it stems from sort of Anglo-Norman Old French. Mm -hmm. And it originally means just a line Right, a line, a row, a file, whatever. Rank and, so and a, file. A line of things is yeah, a rank sure. of things. And then so this line of etymology is fairly straightforward, pardon the pun, because, you know, you get to the military use, a, a row of soldiers kind of arranged 10 abreast or whatever, particularly in like a parade formation. That would be a rank. Um other kind of side things, like a row of squares on a chessboard, those are ranks. Okay. Which I didn't know. I'm not a huge chess nut. Maybe anyone who plays chess literally any more than I do would know that already, but <laughs> I didn't know that. I thought that was interesting. Um, and so another usage that sort of – is another one where there's a bunch of different kind of uses that all come around at the same time, but I feel like it's fairly reasonable to draw the connections between them. Uh, you get the lines of squares, just a line of things. Um, the military use when the soldiers would line up into their various ranks. Uh, the other usage is kind of the one that I think has the most longevity now, which is the sense of hierarchy, like a okay, different yeah, level sure. or step position in hierarchy, military rank, um, to rank things in terms of popularity, all that kind of, that idea. Um, one little tangent thing that I found was that the original French word old French old Norman word that we get rank from might have something to do with or might be connected to an early word for ring and the guess the the sort of educated guess that I found on this not mine someone smarter than me came up with this one is that it had something to do with uh, military formations in general which could either be linear or circular, depending on battle arrangements and circumstances okay. and stuff. So that was kind of interesting. The other interesting thing was is that a, a cognate of rank, so an, a, another word that comes from the same sort of lexical root as rank, is range. As in a fighting range. Yeah, or a mountain range. Oh, because it's a, of course, okay. It's a line of mountains. And then I thought, okay, while I'm already here, how is a mountain range and a cooking range the same? Because I don't know if that's a regionalism for North America, calling a stovetop a range. Not necessarily. In, in Scotland, the range was, was popularly what the cooker was called, but a range was more like an aga type arrangement. You know what I mean by an aga, like a big, a big heavy cast iron stove with several oven ovens in it, yeah, and lots of different doors. That that's what I think of when I think of a range, but you know, certainly in in years gone by, when that was the style of cooker that people were likely to have, 
mm. that's that's a word that I would recognize. You know, your dinner's on the range or in the range. That's right. Yeah. I literally only know the word Aga because yesterday I was watching clips of what I lied to you on YouTube. Ah, there we go. And someone used it and I looked it up because I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> but, Agas are very, they're quite posh. Yeah, people. that was the context. People were making fun of someone for using the word because yeah, he was yeah. obviously very posh for having used it. <laughs> um, however, the, so the range thing. Uh, in 1574, there was a work that's cited in the OED that uses the sentence, Then you must lay these poles upon a couple of forked stalks as spits upon ranges. And so the range for centuries, all I could find was it was a cooking apparatus. Mm -hmm. And that's where, and it just morphed into, because a stovetop, an electric or a gas stovetop is something you cook on, it's called a range because range is always meant as a cooking apparatus. Okay. But it seems like the ranges were the supports on which you put the spit for roasting. Oh, that, that just occurred to me as you said it, that the straight yeah. lines were the spits. And so oh, the straight lines, beautiful. the things that support the spit to roast something over the fire. So that's apparently where how rank and cooking range are related. This, and that's all just, just beautiful. And that's all just the noun because the adjective form of rank <laughs> is not French at all. It's okay. Germanic, and uh, there are other words that sort of stem from the same old German roots in Dutch, German, Swedish, Icelandic. Um, a lot of the other words have the sense of uh, slender or tall. A lot of them have to do with boats and having a property of being kind of liable to tip over. Okay. The earliest English meanings of rank as an adjective were having a very high image of yourself, so proud, haughty, arrogant, or being very showy and ostentatious. Now that's interesting was, because that, to me, has a flavour of because you consider yourself to be ranked above others. Mm-hmm. But that is... In no but way it's, related. It doesn't seem to be, because it seems to be even earlier than when rank started to mean uh, position in a hierarchy. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's great. It's much older than that. And, it, and it, 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 it fell out of use. Like, that was a very, it's a, that was obsolete quite early. Mm-hmm. That's a usage. Another, around that time, so we're talking like 12th century-ish, 12th, 13th century, um, was fast or forceful or violent or strong or way different. Very. Um, the only thing I can think of is that it would, if, if rank referred to ships that were slim and sleek and tall, mm -hmm. those ships, it seems to me, would be quite fast. They'd be more built for speed rather than sturdiness and... yeah lumpiness or whatever else and so i'm wondering if there's <laughs> paulson's maybe, ship right sturdy yeah, and lumpy <laughs> sturdy sturdy and lumpy yeah that's right just you want one of those fast slim ships go somewhere no else. substance over style all the way here uh, so i'm wondering if maybe the violent and fast i mean maybe i'm just racist against old icelandic but my first thought is i don't know did vikings use ships that were very fast and meant for raiding parties and stuff and maybe that's a connection i don't know but um and then it seems to have taken even more sharp twists and turns than nice or silly or a bunch of other words that we've looked at um later but still now obsolete meanings of rank were um referring to things that had become fully grown, reached sexual maturity, that type of thing. Mm, um, that's interesting. Yeah, vegetation that had grown very thickly and exuberantly. I don't know if vegetation can grow exuberantly, but sometimes too thickly, like something just like a, yeah, it like a vine overgrown. that just takes over everything. Mm -hmm. That would be rank. Uh, for a while, it was anything that existed in abundance, anything extremely or excessively great or large. And then this around the word is an absolute whore. It has meant everything. Absolutely. It's just this really weird 
conflation and confluence of these different definitions. Um, in the 15th, 16th century, you start getting senses of outright derogatory nature or undesirable nature. So offensive, uh, luxuriant, coarse, or uh, sort of rotten, being prone to rot and uh, decomposition and stuff like that. Well, that's interesting. When when something is described as rank, as an unpleasant, whether rightly or wrongly, I I it tends to take root in my head as something that would smell or taste unpleasant. Yeah, you know, it's, exactly. It's not just a, it's bad and I don't like it. It's a oh, there is something in there that's rank, as in we would have to clear the room because no one would be able to to take that unpleasantness of smell or sense or taste. You know, something like. Something along those lines. Yeah, there's an emanation from it, mm, yeah. <laughs> which which it's is one. Large. I mean, one of the stems from that is specifically about um, stink. Um, and then it also, from the 16th century on, it's been used simply as a, an intensifier, like a, a better better word than very. So that's where <laughs> rank amateur comes in, because a yeah, rank sure. amateur is just someone who is thoroughly amateur or a rank injustice, and it was just, it didn't have any meaning of its own. It was kind of a word tofu. It just takes on <laughs> whatever's around it and sort of, unlike tofu, gives it a little bit more oomph to it. Um, yeah, just as a, a neutral intensifier. Although it does seem to have, like, it, it, it intensifies bad qualities. I don't know that you'd ever say... It was a rank success, and hope that it meant what you thought it meant. <laughs> so it's a, I guess, unless, uh, unless you were having a bad Roger day. Well, yeah, exactly. So I, yeah, I guess to say is a neutral intensifier isn't quite accurate, but it's an intensifier for derogatory and derision. But yeah, so adjective and noun, nothing to do with each other whatsoever, and other in both all. cases, just means kind of whatever people wanted it to mean. That's. That's great. I really, I really like this, this notion that there are words out there that that are just sort of, they're like jobbing words. Yeah. You've, got word, you've, you've got a meaning for them. Yeah, they can take it on. They, they have a, a slot in their schedule. I'm sure they can fit it in somewhere. Yeah. Um, so. Yes. I, what have you got? I also, I also have a word where there are two. There are two very distinct meanings for this word. And oh, super. For once in my whole lexitecture life, the etymology is very, very clear. The origin of the word can be utterly pinned down. Nice. Just going to get my dictionary on. It's not a necessary thing, but it's it's nice every now and then to just have an answer. Yeah, yeah, now and again, it's it's good to know. Where did that word come from? Oh, right here. <laughs> For this one place. <laughs> okay. So, the word that I am interested in is Yahoo. Y-A-H-O-O. -O. <laughs> if you look it up in the OED... The first meaning that is given is an informal noun, a rude, noisy, or violent person. The right. second meaning that is given is an exclamation expressing great joy or excitement, as in Yahoo, my plan worked. So the first meaning, a rude, noisy, or violent person, was first written down and was created by Swift in Gulliver's Travels. Oh, cool. Now, in Gulliver's Travels, people always know about the Lilliputians, yeah. And they may also know about the giants in Brobdingnag. But in Swift's, in Swift's book, Gulliver visits several different lands. And one of the lands that he visits is the land of the Whinnams. Now, mm. Whinnams is spelled... Give me just a minute, because I never, ever get it right myself. So I'm just going to check this out and get it right. So the Whinnams, Whinnam is spelled H-O-U-Y-H-N-H-N-M-S. Whoa. 
And it's an onomatopoeic word because the Huynims are, in fact, a calm and rational society of intelligent horses. Oh, okay. So Huynim is supposed to represent a horse word, the sort of noise that a horse would make. Right. And in the land of the Huynims, where the horses are the, the intelligent, civilised beings, the yahoos are primitive creatures obsessed with the pretty stones they find by digging in mud. <laughs> and because Gulliver's Travels is, of course, a, a satire, it's, it's a very interesting book. And almost everything... Almost everything refers to something that Swift was directly satirising and a contemporary reference that, that Swift was satirising. So, for example, there's a section where, I forget the name of the people, but they, they're they very intelligent scientists and they are trying to solve scientific mysteries. But all of the things that they are trying to do seem completely nonsensical. Like, they're trying to extract sunshine from oranges. And... <laughs> In fact, all of the nonsensical experiments that these people are carrying out were things that people had tried. Uh, the, the Royal Society or some, some sort of um, scientific society in the 18th century, you know, pe people were doing these things. So, The Land of the Whinnams is part four of Gulliver's Travels. And it's believed that... The Yahoos were the Yahoos stood for Europeans and their behaviour was typical of the Europeans that he had encountered and presumably didn't like much because he turned the he turned the Yahoos into these people who they're they're absolute savages, you know, that they have they have almost no sort of rational thought at all. They're described by the, the Wikipedia entry for Gulliver's Travels. God, I love Wikipedia. <laughs> um, he comes upon a race of hideous, deformed and savage humanoid creatures to which he conceives a violent antipathy. Shortly afterwards, he meets the Whinnams, a race of talking horses. They are the rulers, while the deformed creatures that resemble human beings are called yahoos. So, this, this notion that a yahoo is someone with no manners, who is uncivilised, who cannot behave and is not someone whose society you would seek, directly comes from Swift's inventing of this word to describe the characters in the land of the Whinnams. That's very cool. So I, I, I do very much love Gulliver's Travels. It's a fantastic book and there are lots of very, very interesting quirks about the book. What I really wanted to know was how did Yahoo, as in uh, an, an ill-mannered savage, also come to mean Yahoo, as in hooray. Yeah. And I am unable to determine how those two things, how those two words, those two identical words, have such very, very different meanings. I did read a very interesting article from the New York Times entitled The Way We Live Now on Language. Yeehaw. That's spelled Y-E-E hyphen H A W. Right. And yeehaw is in this article is discussed as an expression of enthusiasm or exuberance typically associated with cowboys or rural inhabitants of the southern US. Yep. Okay. And we uh, w within that within that kind of group of w words of that type, yippee and yahoo and yeehaw are are kind of all all put together. So Yahoo, in the article, it discusses that Swift gave this name to a race of brutal men. However, why do people shout Yahoo when they're happy? Mm. It seems to me, from what I have been able to find out, that way out west, people like to shout things beginning with why. <laughs> and I believe that just as log was one of these R words someone made a noise and it happened to fit that thing, that piece of yeah. meat in front of them, that Yahoo is nothing more than a noise that people happen to like the sound of. The New York Times article discusses that there may be an association with yell. So we have things like yippee i -yay, yowie yay and yo, hmm. yeehaw and Yahoo. Essentially, this is a good fun noise to make. It sounds... Yeah. 
It sounds joyous. It sounds like an exaltation. And of course, there's Yahoo, the internet business. Apparently, I didn't realise this, that Yahoo is an acronym for yet another hierarchical officious oracle. I'd rather suspect it's been backwards engineered, reverse engineered from, from the word. I've also seen Yahoo, the acronym given as, oh, I can't find it now. The Urban Dictionary, that great font of knowledge. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, it describes it as um, you always have other options. Nice. I don't know if that is a judgment of the uh, of the the web services or if it's generally a let's be positive and shout Yahoo when things are difficult. You always have another option. You always have other options. Uh, I'm I'm not too sure. Huh. However, I did find something interesting out about Yeehaw. Okay. Which we can at least assume is, if not a brother, then perhaps a cousin. So it's that gotta one, be related. They, you yeah. Know, they, they get together at weddings and funerals <clears throat> and get drunk and, and make interesting noises. Yeah, they definitely and do all of those things. Absolutely. And while Yahoo seems simply to be a noise, and whether or not Swift used that noise or or was aware of that noise and used it as the name for his race of people, or whether it's just one of those crazy etymological coincidences, mm. Yeehaw actually has a bit more sense behind it. Because in Jack London's short story of 1911, or the name of which I have lost, he writes about the sled dogs, sleigh dogs, as they were driving in single file without reins, he had to guide them by his voice. And it was evident the head dog had never learned the meaning of G and haw. Uh... And apparently, I didn't know this, but G with a soft G is usually a direction to a horse to turn right and haw is a direction to turn left. So to shout yee-haw is to say turn left, turn right. Whether or not that makes any more sense than shouting yahoo when you are celebrating something, horse-related or otherwise, I'm mm. not sure. But there is yahoo, the Swiftian, very easy to pin down etymology, and yahoo, the noise that seems to make people feel happy. That's fantastic. I have to read Gulliver's Travels again. I haven't read it through in what seems like forever. Yeah. I, I, but every time I read anything of, about, or by Swift, mm, you want I love to know it. more. Yeah, absolutely. I took a module at university in 18th century literature, so we spent a long time looking at Gulliver's Travels because oh, I bet. it's... Yeah, it's, it's an important book. I wonder what Roger has to say about Yahoo. Now, yeah, as we've found in the past, sort of slang words don't that they're not terribly well represented in Roger so let's have a look here. but I wonder if slang oh. words with such prestigious ling or literature prestigious Yahoo. literary backgrounds might I don't know only one synonym low fellow so yeah they've, okay. they've very much spoken to the the swifty and meaning of the word rather mm. than hooray yeah it's I'm the, quite interested to see here. what Section low fellow belongs to six and nine. Mm, commonalty, commonalty, not commonality. C O M M O N A L T by presumably as oh, in okay. class. Yeah, so yeah. we have common third estate bourgeoisie middle classes plebs plebeians vulgar haired great unwashed. <laughs> Great unnumbered, hoi polloi. The general rank and file, ragtag and bobtail, Tom, Dick and Harry. Within that, we have the the, the yahoos. Okay, mm. yeah. And Roger doesn't take into account the, the wonderful exhilaration of just opening your lungs and making a noise that sounds joyful. Yeah, well, that's his loss. Need. Yeah, well, Roger has quite a few entries for rank in the alphabetical index. Okay. Some of which are quite interesting themselves. So, relativeness, degree, graduate or graduate, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, no, graduate, graduate the verb. Consummate, as in, I, I suppose there, there is your intensifier. Yeah. Uh, order or class. Serial place, classification. Vegetal, which is another word I don't think mm. I've ever seen before. Unsavoury, fetid, good word. That's a great estimate. word. Estimate. Mm, estimate. That's bizarre. Plenteous, importance, bad, formation, prestige, nobility, heinous, or impure. Fetid, I'm going to, uh, not fetid, sorry, uh, estimate, I'm going to take a look at. Yeah. While you're doing that, it just a, the consummate thing, that pretty much cap, that encapsulates the problem with thesauruses because yeah, indeed. that's exactly that idea. That the, Well, I made the mistake just now saying that it's just a neutral intensifier when in fact it's clearly not. You would call someone a consummate professional. You wouldn't call them a rank professional. Not twice anyway. <laughs> you Yeah. Hmm. I'm interested about estimate though. That's... That's weird to me. I'm oh, the curious section, as to how that works. The section that estimate belongs to, 480, judgment or conclusion. So I suppose oh, that, you know, if, if you're being asked things, to rank like, things in order, then you may be estimating by ranking. Oh, uh, I guess, yeah. Mm, yeah, I hadn't thought of that either. Hmm. It's, it is very interesting to me that in that same section contains the word doom. <laughs> oh, Nice. <laughs> Yeah, not the sort of judgment we were after, but hey, sometimes you just get doomed. That's how it goes. <laughs> what are you going to do? I very much love it when things evolve separately but end up in the same place. Yeah. So my generally my favourite example is the Scots language. Because people... Scots is recognised as a language. And people often assume that Scots is a dialect of English. But in right. fact, they are two languages which just happen to evolve along very, very similar lines. Mm-hmm. And the proximity of English speakers and Scots speakers, I'm sure, did did you know something along its way to influence that. But they are they are not. Neither is a, a dialect or an offshoot of each other. They just happened to grow in gardens that were quite close to each other. Yeah, and their flowers kind of look the same most of the time. It was cross-pollination, but not actual. And that's it for this episode of Lexitecture. Thanks for listening, and if you enjoyed what you heard, please give us a rating and review on iTunes, and be sure to tell all your word nerd friends about us too. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter by searching Lexitecture, L-E-X-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E. And if you'd like to get in touch with us about the things we talked about this episode, you can send us an email at words at lexitecture.com. Special thanks to the Joy Drops for our theme music, and we'll talk to you again next week. 